Welcome back to my last segment. In the past three segments, we have discussed longer term or strategic security management decisions. Now we change that perspective towards more operational aspects. How do we actually run information security in an organization? Of course, operational security is full of nitty gritty details. Industry associations have filled thousands of pages to define terms and document standards. I've collected some important keywords here on the slide. Please look them up if there's anything that doesn't ring a bell. I'm sure that those who are familiar with security standards agree that it would be pointless to squeeze a digest of these documents into a short video unit. Many practitioners also complain that the standards are abstract and leave too much room for inter interpretation. Some even argue that standards are mainly made to document what I call best practice security in the earlier lecture on security strategy. My intention here is to give you a structured checklist, short enough to memorize, that helps organizing the tasks of a person in charge of information security, or for larger organizations, to organize the work in an information security team or a division. I assume that the objective is to get as much real security as is economical for the organization. I will first talk about the tasks of organizations in the role of security consumers and extend the discussion to specifics of security providers at the end of this segment. We will not go into depth for the security industry because the way to organize security operations there depends very much on a specific business model. As a side note, if you're unfamiliar with our terminology of security consumers, security providers and the security industry, please revisit the first segment in this block called security strategy before you continue. The way I look at operational security is to broadly distinguish between proactive and reactive tasks. Proactive tasks make sure that business and security objectives are met in a perfect organization running perfect software. Reactive tasks are necessary because no organization or IT system is perfect. Let's start with the proactive tasks. The core of information security is to make and enforce authorization decisions with regard to a set of protection goals, such as confidentiality, integrity, availability, and some special variants thereof. It all boils down to the question, who may access what resource? To systematically make these decisions and eventually automate many of them, we first need to define subjects, who, and resources what? Subjects in the real world are mapped to digital identities in a computer system. Identity management ensures that this mapping is correct and that the system can identify and authenticate users as well as remote systems acting on behalf of users. In typical organizations, identity management interacts with the human resources department to create digital identities, also called accounts, for newcomers and delete them for people who leave. Other tasks include secure distribution, revocation and reset of access credentials. Typical challenges arise if the borderline between organizations gets blurry. Shall we create user accounts for interns, consultants, subsidiaries, even customers? Where to draw the line and how to formulate this in a transparent and practical policy? Identity management has many other facets such as interoperability and privacy issues. Establishing it in a large organization or an entire industry is a very demanding task, but it is essential to do it systematically because all other security builds on it. Like subjects, we also have to manage the objects of authorization decisions. This refers to enumerating and classifying all information assets of an organization. Challenges to this end are the sheer amount of information and their dynamics over time. New information is generated and classification grades may change. For instance, a press release must be treated as confidential before the release date and public thereafter. However, a draft version of it must remain confidential. Occasionally, people ask me, why classify at all? Can't we just encrypt all information? The answer is no, that's not the point. Even if you encrypt all information, you must decide which key to use and with whom to share it. That is where identity management meets key management. What is more, 
every organization needs to access and make available different kinds of information in different situations. Enforcing the highest level of security for all information does not only come at a high direct cost. Think of specialized hardware security modules to protect your most valuable assets, such as private signing keys. Rather, the indirect cost due to the inconvenience of getting work done would dwarf the direct cost and quickly render this idea uneconomical. Once subjects as well as objects are identified and managed, it remains to define their relation. In theory, one can imagine an organization-wide access control matrix, storing the permissions of subjects to access objects. Thousands of research papers have been written on how to organize and update this imaginary matrix in practical settings. So-called access control models make use of data structures, such as sets and trees, to map organizational hierarchies onto the access control matrix. It belongs to the tasks of operational security to choose an access control model, define processes for change requests, and regularly check for correct implementation. One particular challenge in organizations is that the access control models implemented in different components of the IT system are not compatible, often not even across the layers of a software stack. For example, an enterprise resource planning system may have sophisticated user management supporting roles and delegation. Its underlying database uses a different model, and the operating system beneath uses default Unix permissions. Add an overarching security suite or antivirus product that uses yet another implicit, often simple and heuristic model. In this patchwork, authorization decisions are taken at every layer, and it is difficult to keep an overview or trace bugs. Overprivileging is common practice to make things work, but it creates headache from a security point of view. All these processes involve technology and people. Training people to know the processes, to comply with them, and to apply the right judgment when decisions with potential security impact have to be made by end users belongs to the proactive tasks of operational security management as well. Identity management, resource classification, and automatic access control are everything you need to be secure in a perfect world. In practice, mistakes happen at all layers, raising the need for reactive tasks. First and foremost is patch management. Software bugs that allow privilege escalation, that is another term for circumventing access control, are discovered every single day. All proactive security is useless if vulnerable software lets the attacker in by the back door. Many software vendors release patches to fix known holes in their products, but it is the responsible of the user to install them. There is also a trade-off, because some patches introduce new bugs and may break running systems. So a lot of attention is needed to do it right, depending on the organization's specific objectives. If the organization falls victim to an attack, three tasks go hand in hand. Intrusion detection, incident management, and forensics. Intrusion detection is highly automated, but human attention is needed to interpret the signals and maintain alert threshold and notification channels. Incident management requires a combination of broad technical and communication skills. Solving problems and communicating with various stakeholders under high time pressure is the norm rather than an exception. To reduce the pressure when incidents occur, emergency plans and backup systems can be devised preemptively. In some industries, this is even mandatory. Finally, forensics aims at extracting evidence for investigations and intelligence for future defense after an incident has happened. It involves manual analytical tasks carried out with tool support and sometimes the involvement of external contractors who build up forensic expertise from looking at many similar cases. This collection of proactive and reactive tasks pretty much completes the picture for a typical security consumer. Security providers have additional responsibilities. The most important additional proactive task for security providers is to distinguish, to establish secure programming practices in all development teams. Otherwise, the most inexperienced programmer working on a superficial feature can potentially compromise the security of the entire product. Establishing secure development practices requires a security-minded selection of the development toolchain 
including frameworks and libraries, as well as repeated training of developers, for example, on input validation. This should reduce the number of vulnerabilities per line of code quite substantially to spot the remaining bugs, carry out extensive tests with specialized fuzzing tools, organize security code reviews and hire penetration testers, best compensated by the number of problems they find. Be aware that if you implement or integrate cryptography, then your developers need a much more rigorous testing and quality assurance process, which requires substantial expertise in security engineering. Way too much to summarize here. Turning to reactive tasks, security providers find themselves on the supply side of the patching process. It is important to define and communicate a strategy for patch provision and reserve sufficient resources de to develop, test, and release patches quickly. Pre preparatory tasks for a smooth patching process are to establish a security contact to receive information about potential vulnerabilities, as well as an automated and secure patch distribution channel. Now step back and reflect about the essential components of operational security management. Compare this blueprint to your organization. Who is in charge of what? How are the tasks organized and assigned to different people and organizational units? What has worked and where are potential issues? Can you attribute issues and incidents to failed processes or suboptimal distribution of responsibilities? And even if nothing went wrong in the past, how can you attribute this to your operational security management? You may find some answers, but also many question marks. Security management as a subdiscipline is still in its infancy and it will probably remain an inexact science. After all, a security manager's standing within an organization will always depend on a combination of skill and luck. And this concludes the block on security investment and risk management. I encourage you to work through the quizzes and assignments and to join the discussion on the forums. You are also invited to join the webinar on this part of the course. Please visit the course site for the exact date and time.